Hello everyone, this is Kelly Corsi Gray and welcome to the Art of Photography lesson number eight. If I played the lottery and happened to win a big payout, I would probably spend the rest of my life traveling around the world, photographing wildlife and visiting new places. Luckily enough, I've actually structured my life that even though I don't have millions of dollars, my job actually is to get out in nature and look for wildlife and help people take photos and really appreciate and enjoy the incredible environment that we live in and that you can visit in various places. So I was thrilled this past weekend when I got to go to Maryland briefly and I was attending a memorial service, but there happened to be an osprey nest right next to the pavilion because we were on the Chesapeake Bay. So this is one of the photos that I got of this gorgeous mother osprey, and here you can see two of her chicks. Now I took a lot of photos and that's the number one thing I'll recommend to you if you ever start to take a lot of wildlife photography learn to set your camera on burst mode or learn to use the burst mode on your phone because the more pictures you take the more you have to choose from and wildlife moves and the camera and the focus and the light everything changes very quickly. The more pictures you have to choose from, the happier you'll be with the results. So this is one of the ones that I chose as one of my favorites because you can see the mother, you can see two chicks, and one of them is trying out its wings. As you know, photography is about light, and so if you're taking a picture of wildlife, you're taking a picture of the light falling on wildlife. It's very important that you turn off your flash. You don't want to use flash with wildlife. It will scare or traumatize the animals and your uh, creature will leave the area probably exceedingly quickly. So you just need to work with your camera or throw it on auto and use the available light. So we've spoken about aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. One of the things that you may wanna do if you've got a wildlife subject that you're really excited about, A, you wanna take a lot of pictures. I will keep reminding you, take a lot of images, especially when things are moving. But the other thing you may want to do is you may want to have an aperture of f.4 or uh, f4 or less. You may want to have a fast shutter speed. So when you leave the ISO on auto, that will work out nicely for you. With wildlife photography, you're always dealing with light, the composition, and of course the moment or subject and wildlife is tricky wildlife does what it wants when it wants and no matter what you say to it, it they are not going to pay attention and turn and smile when you want them to now one of the key things that you need to keep in mind to get great wildlife shots in my opinion is this is where it's really handy to put the grid of the rule of thirds on your camera. Now for this lesson this week, I will be speaking more about cameras because cell phones have a very limited ability to zoom. And when it comes to wildlife, very little of it is going to walk right up to you. For the most part, the wildlife is going to be pretty far away. I like to use these points, the four points of the tic-tac-toe board that you see here, and I try to put the wildlife there. I try to focus on the wildlife and put it in one of those points, but if all else fails, just get it in the middle of the shot and you can crop the shot later. Now, cell phones are getting better and better with their optics. 
but currently a lot of cell phones only have a one to two times optical zoom. After that, it's a digital zoom. And thus, you're not really getting a good image if you're using a digital zoom because the digital zoom takes a picture and then just moves in closer on the picture it's been taken. An optical zoom actually gets you closer to the subject. Now, there are some incredible cell phone cameras out there these days that have some amazing zooms. I currently don't have one of those cameras, and for wildlife, I typically use my big DSLR or mirrorless cameras. I'm now a mirrorless girl with Sony. So this is the best photo you should ever get of a bear. Here are the bears but you'll notice they are tiny. The reason this is the best photo you should ever get with a cell phone of a bear is for your safety and also for the bear's safety. Now, the reason I love wildlife photography is because I love wildlife. I don't ever wanna harm any of the creatures that I'm taking photographs of and I don't want to impact them in a negative way. So one of the biggest rules or ethical guidelines to follow is if an animal or bird or whatever you're photographing changes its behavior, you are the one that is too close. Typically, if you back up a few steps, the animal will get used to you being there and ignore you completely. So allow the animal to do its thing. You're going to have better photographs at the end of the day, and you're gonna have a more rewarding experience. Plus that animal will not be impacted by you. One of the most critical things to do before you go out and try to photograph any animal is research. Read about that animal. Is it a carnivore? Does it eat meat? Would it eat you? Is it an herbivore? Does it only eat plants? What time of day is that animal active? Is it crepuscular? That's a dawn and dusk animal. We'll talk more about that. Think about if this animal is dangerous or not. And by reading and researching about what it eats and what it does, you can find that animal. You're not going to find a moose in the middle of a desert. Moose like water and they like aquatic plants in the summer. Each season, the animals do things differently as well. So the more you research, the more you know. And I usually keep a field guide or two. Either I have them on my uh, phone as an app or I have them physically in my car or in my bag. So the time of day that you go out looking for wildlife is really critical. You're not going to find an owl in the middle of the day unless something is very strange. You are not going to necessarily find very many animals in the heat of the day unless perhaps you're looking for an alligator in Florida on the beach sunning itself. So there are certain things you have to know by doing your research. You'll know the time of day or early morning, early evening to look for those creatures. Equipment. All of the images that I'm showing you today were shot with a digital SLR or mirrorless camera and I typically have a very big lens on it. What do I mean by that? Uh, I currently use a 1 to 400 millimeter lens with a 1.4 extender on it, so that takes me about 600 millimeters. I use a camera that goes out, um, so sometimes cameras have 24 times optical, something like that is what you're looking for. You're looking for a piece of equipment that keeps you safe and keeps the animal safe while letting everyone have a great experience. Now it's very tempting to feed animals to get them to come close to you. 
It is exceedingly unethical to do so. A fed animal is a dead animal. And unfortunately, when people start to feed certain creatures like bears, unfortunately, in many states, the bears pay the ultimate price for the human's stupidity. So please do not feed or bait animals to get photographs. If you are going to photograph animals, practice observing, being still. And the best part of wildlife photography for me is the surprises. I might go to a place where I think I might find a bear or a moose, but I might find a river otter or a beaver making its dam. You never know. And that's one of the best parts of this for me is there aren't that many big surprises left. Wildlife photography, you can have a lot of fun with surprise. Here we've got a huge bull moose and I took this photo at dusk. So this is a, a nice photo of the moose except it's really a very dark animal in a very dark place. But this is when those animals come out. However, you can find moose during the daylight. But this big fella was in Denali. Now here, it looks like I'm right next to this female moose. She was eating some aquatic plants and blowing bubbles. It was really a moosmerizing experience, if you know what I mean. But she was out in the middle of the day and just eating. Because I had a long lens, it looks like I'm right next to her, but she just went on doing what she was doing, and I went on photographing, and it was great fun. Here's a moose in the distance, and this is a nice shot. I like this because it shows the atmosphere. It shows where the moose lives, what it's doing, and it's a beautiful time of day, so there's a lot of nice coloration, and the light is nice, kind of accentuating her lines there. Now, moose and deer, I live in Pennsylvania currently, and we have white-tailed deer in our yard all the time. And these are Sitka, black-tailed deer. This was taken, both of these were taken in Alaska. Obviously, someone has fed this deer because this deer walked right up to me. I did snap a picture or two, but then I made sure to back up and give the deer its space because I didn't want to uh, put any undue stress on this creature. Very often, you can only get images of wildlife from a great distance. So I like to keep my binoculars handy and even if you're in a boat, I actually took this image from a boat and we were looking up at a sheer cliff face and that's a, a nice spot for the mountain goats. And here the mountain goat babies are trying out their legs and doing some jumping about. Now, when it comes to photographing wildlife, some animals move faster than others. As I said, I really like to put the grid on my camera so that I can frame the shot. And I try to put the creature's face and eyes in my focus point, and I try to make one of those focus points um, the corners of the tic-tac-toe board, the rule of thirds. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. The great thing today with cameras is they have so much information, they're taking so many megapixels that you can usually crop in and get what you need. Now when it comes to wildlife, bears are of course very exciting subjects. The first animal I really became obsessed with were moose, but ultimately moose stand around a lot eating and then they lay down a lot and do quite a bit of sleeping. So I'm quickly moved on to bears as a subject matter that would be entertaining. This is a gorgeous little second year cub and the mama bear was teaching it how to do some fishing. 
Now it looks like I'm right in front of this bear and that I'm going to get run over. I assure you, I was not. I was on an elevated platform looking down at a river and I had a 600 millimeter lens on this particular bear. So I was perfectly safe and so was the bear. And the bear was learning how to fish. And one of the best things you can get when you're looking for wildlife shots are baby animals, young animals, because they do everything. They exaggerate everything. They play with their food. And this bear was really giving it a go. And I, I like the action. I like that there's a bit of blur with the bear, but its face is in focus. So for me, the face has to be in focus, the face and the eyes in a shot like this because we see the face. And of course, we are looking always toward the eyes. So one of the key aspects of wildlife photography, and now they even have cameras smart enough that you can put on face detection and you can choose human or animal. So your camera these days can really assist you in uh, getting these types of shots. Now, I didn't have that with this shot, but I thought it was a, a pretty exciting moment to capture. Now, I probably took a whole series of shots. I usually set my camera to continuous mode. And so I hit the shutter button and it goes click, 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 click. I can't even do it very fast, but the camera is incredibly quick. And I also, a few weeks ago, we talked about those SD cards or computer chips. The chips that you put in your camera have to be as fast as your camera for you to get the benefit of what your camera can do. So this was a shot that I took in Alaska in 2011 or so. And so I did not have the camera power that I do today. And so I am always looking for times where I can get back out and photograph more bears. Bears are really fun subject matter. They do all sorts of fun things. This is an image I photographed from a moving vessel, a, a ship last year. And instead of zooming in on the bear, I did get a few of those shots. This iceberg was floating by. And so I thought, oh, you know, it'll be really cool to put this bear, which is a pretty big black bear, in the context of the huge landscape that it's in and its vicinity to a glacier that is calving. And so uh, this is much more of an atmospheric shot, a picture that shows you an animal in its environment. And notice the bear blends in pretty nicely there. Now, this is one of my favorite shots that I've ever gotten of a bear. And again, this was a juvenile bear. Its mom was relatively close. And this bear, again, was learning how to fish. But the color contrast of the brown bear and the beautiful red salmon there really, really works. Now, the bear itself is pretty much in the middle of the frame, so I have broken one of those rules. But this is all about the bear and the fish and the action and the water and the splash. And so this is one of my favorites. Now, I also want to mention that when you're around bears, bears especially, but any predatory animal, if you're in a large group of people, you're much safer. So there are very few, if any, documented attacks of bears on people once you have a group of five or six people together. Now you stay together with your group and the bear thinks you're one big scary monster lump with many feet. So you have to know about the creature you are photographing, and I always use the utmost caution around bears. Typically, you want to give yourself a football field, for those of you in the United States, a hundred yards between you and a bear. Any color bear, any kind of bear, give them plenty of space. 
Bears can run 35 miles per hour and they can outrun any Olympic sprinter. So make sure that you never, ever, ever run near a bear because if you act like food, they will treat you like food. Here, this bear is completely occupied with the salmon, having a great time. And believe it or not, there were about 20, 25 people, and we were all snapping our pictures and having a great time watching this youthful bear get its fish. Now, often it's nice to tell a story with your photos, and here you can see a fisherman in Alaska as a big old brown bear walks beside him. The rule in Alaska is if a bear wants your fish, cut the line and give it to him. Here you can see a black bear. This black bear has caught itself a salmon and they really enjoy eating the eggs. So here I got in as close as I could and really metered my light meter on the black bear. Now, if you'll put the grid on this photo, you'll notice that I tried to put the bear's eyes on the bottom part of my tic-tac-toe board right around there. And uh, black bears can be especially tough to photograph because if there's bright sunlight and dark shadow, they disappear altogether. So you really have to understand your light meter and make sure that you're metering the bear's fur, sometimes even under exposing. Now, don't forget about the other things. Before the bear appears, you might have quite a bit of time to wait. Bears and other creatures that you want to see don't just pop out of the woods because you're there to photograph them. So if you're near a stream with salmon, hoping to see a bear or something else come down and have a meal, photograph the fish. So this is a red salmon heading upstream. And here you can see uh, the fish is squirreling its way up the river. And so I got some action there. But a few years ago, I decided I wanted to get even closer to these salmon. So I got a little underwater video camera and I took some stills out of my video so that I could see what the salmon looked like underwater. I didn't have my little underwater camera with me. So um, anyway, this one's a bit cloudy, but you can get some really interesting things. And a lot of people have GoPros these days. You can stick that type of camera on a stick, make sure it's in an underwater casing and then you can use your phone sometimes to see what it sees and then choose to take a video or a picture. I also love to get the salmon jumping up the river and I probably took whew, hundreds, probably three, 400 shots because you have to, of course, have the uh, shutter pressed almost before the fish are jumping. But if you get a whole slew of action, you can just take a bunch of shots and throw away the ones that don't matter. We don't have film anymore. We don't have to pay for processing. It's digital. You can just delete the ones that don't work. Birds can be an especially tough subject. I love photographing birds, but this is where your knowledge of your camera. Take a few minutes, read the manual, Google up how-to videos on YouTube and other places. Find out as much as you can about how your equipment works in particular. If you have access to a photographer friend, definitely take your camera with you and ask them. And uh, I help people all the time. If I see someone struggling when I'm out taking pictures, I always stop to help people so that they can get some nice shots. I was pretty excited to get this very explosive, splashing, tufted puffin in this particular shot. And notice I do have the back of the bird, but you can see its little face and its eyes. So I made sure that the eye was in focus and then the splash comes from the fact that this bird is moving fast and even though I have a fast shutter speed, um, I still got a little bit of blur because this water is going nuts. Now sometimes the creatures you want to photograph are sitting prettily. 
And these two bald eagles were sitting beautifully for me. And luckily I had my camera and I was ready. One thing about wildlife photography, I used to live out west and I used to drive and any time I was driving anywhere, I had my camera on the front seat loaded with the battery, ready to rock and roll. And I tend to do that even now. If I know I have time to stop, I tend to travel with my camera on the front seat unless I have a passenger and then sometimes they have to hold my camera. Um, but sometimes your creatures will pose and when they do pose, that's when you can really take a few minutes and take several shots, but really compose your shot. So I put the eagles on the right hand third of the image. I really like, uh, especially with birds, you like to leave room in front of the bird. So if they were to get up and start to fly, you have the ability to capture that, but it also gives you some breathing room in the composition. So here we've got our eagles. You can see both of them and their beaks and their talons, absolutely stunning birds and happily sitting. Now, when they are in flight, when a bird is in flight, this is again where you need to know how to use your camera and how fast it focuses and if it's better for you to set the focus yourself or in some instances, the cameras have gotten so smart that the autofocus is made for wildlife photography. So this is a shot where I probably had my focus point on one of the lines in my tic-tac-toe, my rule of thirds board. And then I made sure that my eagle's face had the focus. Now you'll notice there's another eagle off in the background because I probably had this down to an F3.2 or an F4 so that I could be sharp on the eagle and allow a lot of light in. Um, this is an instance where I took a lot of pictures of this eagle since it was flying toward me. Some of them are in focus, some of them are not, some of them have another eagle in them, some of them don't, but I thought this one was quite successful. Here, someone threw a fish into the water and uh, either, I, I forget if someone had thrown a fish or if this was an uh, eagle that had seen a fish and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Always, if somebody does, throw a fish or if you are out on the water and there are birds circling, if they see something on the water, you focus on that. The bird will come to you and then you can be ready and in focus. So this is a juvenile bald eagle and it, it grabbed a fish in its talons and it is flying off. Now, I spend a lot of my time on the ocean and so I love to photograph whales. But whales stay 90% of their lives, they're underwater completely and they don't show very much of themselves. So how do you start to spot a whale? Well, you look for its spout or blow, which is pictured here. The whale has to exhale so it comes up and it spouts. And that way you can start to keep your eye on that whale and try to get some photos. One of the classic photos that people want to get is the tail shot. And how do you know when a humpback is about to fluke or flip its tail up at you? Well, it makes a very big arch of its back, a hump back, and that's how it's got its name. So the whale on the right is arching and it's about to flip its tail and the one on the left, the tail is coming up. And so you just wait another second or you just click, click, click multiple shots and you've got a whole sequence of the whale's tail. Now typically you're doing this from a moving vessel so I like to use a really fast shutter speed whatever your lens is so if I have my 600 millimeter lens out then I am at least at 1 600th of a second. So you want to be very fast 
um, because otherwise you're going to get blur. And when you're on a moving boat, you have to spread your feet and kind of create a spot where you feel like you are stable and lean up against things. Also, always put that camera strap over your head or on your wrist. You don't want your camera to go over. This is a nice shot of a mom and a baby humpback whale. And this is usually about as much whale as you will see unless they breach. And that means when they jump out of the water. But here, both of these whales are taking a big breath and then they're going to dive down and swim around and eat for a while before they come back up. Here is an orca and here, you uh, can see that the light is shimmering off the tall fin of this gorgeous orca. So I caught this at the right time of day and I made sure the head, you can see the, the front of the orca and the white patch right near its eye. Uh, so this is a fun shot. It's in the middle, but with wildlife, you kind of have to take what you can get and you can certainly crop it if you want to be more artistic. The key is get the animal in the picture, make sure that animal is in focus. And if you can get the eyes, get the eyes in focus as well. Here you can see a baby orca in the center and you can see its little eye as well as the eye patch and some of the female orca right next to her. This is an incredible moment of bubble net feeding. So by researching the whales and knowing the area, I was in Juneau, Alaska and in the right place at the right time. And I was able to chronicle an incredible thing where all the whales come up and feed cooperatively. By getting this, you can also see the baleen in the top of the whale's mouth which is a really cool aspect. Baleen whales don't have teeth. They have these baleen plates that you can see here and that they use those plates to strain out all of the water and keep the small fish that they're going to swallow uh, in their mouths. Here's a little tail flip. You have to be ready for anything anytime when it comes to wildlife. Have your camera. Don't put it down, don't turn it off. If something's happening, just stay with it and don't turn your head. There's another whale shot. So this is a whale and I had taken several pictures because this whale started to lunge forward really, really um, aggressively. And this is where I made a big mistake. I took too many pictures and I had a slower chip, it was an older camera. And, uh, and then right after this, the whale breached. Thank goodness there was enough space to get one shot. I was holding down the shutter, but my chip was buffering. It was writing all the information from the pictures I had taken previously. But luckily I got this one shot of this whale jumping. And I can tell you it took me three and a half years to get this breach shot. Um, something with some atmosphere, it was beautiful light, and you can see some of the background. It doesn't happen like this every day or every whale watch. Now there are lots of animals out there. Sometimes you go in search of an orca or a humpback and you come across some really cute little harbor seals on the ice near a glacier. Sometimes there are sea lions. So you try to get images of the sea lions and here you get them uh, barking at each other. Here they're lying around on the ground. And you can also get in to my absolute favorite, one of my favorite creatures, the sea otter. Now, anytime you're photographing a sea otter, most of the time you're on a moving vessel. So this is a picture of a raft. That's a group of sea otters. But always look for opportunities. 
I took a whole series of photos and I'm going to show them to you relatively quickly. But I found where some sea otters were hanging out. Typically, if you have to go out on a boat, you have to pay to get out on the boat. Somebody has to pay for the fuel. Very often you're on an excursion and it can be quite costly. So if you really like aquatic wildlife, you have to think about where you can find it and how you can get the images that you want. So I walked around the small boat harbor in Seward, Alaska, and there I found my dream come true. There were otters hanging out and I was able to just walk up and down the docks near the boats and there were a whole bunch of sea otters that just were resting right there. They were probably also looking for scraps, but they would dive down and they would pick up mussels and clams. This guy found a crab. This guy found uh, something delectable to eat. So they would dive down and I could get pictures of all the common behaviors of the otter and I was standing on a stable platform, which makes it a lot more easy to photograph, with my zoom lens. And instead of being 100 yards, 300 yards away from these creatures, I was maybe 15, 20 feet. I really didn't even need my super big zoom lenses. By using this opportunity, I got some pictures that people were very surprised that I had because typically otters are quite frightened of boats when they get close, but I was just walking around. I gave the otters their space. They were playing, sleeping and eating, doing what otters do. And they completely ignored me. And sometimes they even gave me sweet little smiles. So we started the week with an osprey. I was very excited to uh, have something other than flowers to photograph. I do love flowers, but it was very cool to uh, see a gorgeous osprey and her chicks. And so I took advantage of the opportunity and got quite a few nice photos of wildlife. The key to wildlife is patience, research, and passion for the creatures, I would say. So find yourself an animal to photograph. Maybe you have a pet, maybe you have a dog or a cat or something else, or you can go outside, see if you can find a squirrel, a chipmunk, a rabbit, or something else that moves. And try using the rule of thirds to take a few photographs and see what you get. You're gonna find that it takes some practice because these creatures move quickly. You want to make sure that the eyes are in focus and unfortunately you don't want to take a whole bunch of pictures of an animal's caboose. Most people don't like to see just the caboose of an animal. So take a lot of pictures, delete the ones you don't like, choose your best, and as always post your favorites on the SAML webpage and let us see what you're up to. Well, that's it for lesson number eight. I'll be back in the near future with the art of photography lesson number nine. Thanks for viewing. And if you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and share it with your friends. My name's Kelly. Have fun taking pictures.